to everybody again. It's, it's my honor again to w welcome Professor Anantha Murthy, Madam Mrs. Anantha Murthy. Um, last time I sort of announced a, a literary club. This, I guess, is a formal inauguration of it. Um, I think what we, the way we see it is just a sort of space for people. We really want to invite anyone who's interested in these things from, <coughs> we don't want it to be just our department. We want anyone who's interested in it from and, then, and we want to make it a space where everyone feels included. So you do not have to have any particular literary background, just an interest and a desire. Um, and I just want people to come in, and the way we emphasize it as it stands is just uh, a sort of place where people come and share work, and um, either their own, if they're too hesitant to do that, with other people's work, it's just to start some sort of conversation around literary and intellectual topics going. So we want to make it about literature, but also a little bit outside of it, which is why uh, we are here also to hear Professor Anthony to speak about poetics too, not just the text. So a slightly larger sense of how the, the literary text of the cultural work opens out into the larger world. So this is actually an inviting space. It's not to intimidate people and say we are more literary than thou and all that. I mean, everyone is welcome. On the other hand, the only thing I would ask for is that people come with a sense of of contributing a little bit. So I do want to distinguish it somewhat strongly from just an art or a literature appreciation course. But we're not going to explain why a poem is great or something like that. That's not quite the intent. It's more that you would come with what you think is good and then we can all discuss why and we can all agree on why it's so great or maybe not so great or whatever. It's some sort of core of the conversation. And we really do want it to uh, include people from outside the department, people from non literary backgrounds. So this is some sort of an outreach that when you bring whoever else you think might be um, might be interested. So it's a well, uh, it's an inclusive space. So I promise you on that. Some of you all have signed up for this for notification or the email. If you haven't, give it to me so that you can. And if a lot of people come from outside, then you know we are flexible and we can evolve the structure of what we will debate in that club. Right? It doesn't have to be something very rigid. You can have welcome stuff from other languages as long as you also help us with the people who are familiar with that language. So, uh, broadly, then that's, that was the idea, and I welcome you all again. And, and I will ask the director, Professor Sundar Sarita, to introduce Professor Anthony. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to have all of you here. Uh, we've been thinking about this for some time, and uh, Context, but there are many contexts for starting this event, this particular activity. Um, one, of course, from this year, as many of you know, our center has also started a MA in English. It's, uh, it's a interdisciplinary program lecture. With, and what is very special to this program, unlike most of the programs of the country, is that one, uh, the students of uh, literature in English. Study other disciplines, it's an interdisciplinary approach to literature. So they do philosophy, they do social sciences. And two, there is also uh, a far greater emphasis on Indian literatures as uh, compared to uh, you know, the regular syllabus of uh, you know, just reading Western literature, canons of Western literature. So we want to look at how Indian literature has been imagined in different uh, languages. It's not restricted to Kannada or Bengali or Marathi. But how does a nation get formed? How are the people's imagination get formed through literature? That's to us uh, the greatest window to the formation of the civilization. So this whole uh, um, course is going to be that. And uh, so as part of it, we have been, and then this year we have got some very good, uh, a lot of very good students have joined us who are very interested in uh, literature and who are also many of them who are practicing writers or very interested in continuing the writing skills together writing and other skills. So all our students, even from our earlier batch and our PhD students, and so they've always been engaged in this question of writing, doing different kinds of writing, and so including fiction, non fiction, non-fiction poetry and so on. So we wanted a forum where we can actually engage in this from a deep, give them uh, more forums to start doing something creatively, get a forum where they can actually do their writing, discuss it among their peers and so on. Things which Writers' movements have done so well earlier, including the movements which have been 
So uh, it is in that context we've been wanting to start a club. I think it has been thinking about it for some time. And then we thought when uh, Professor Anand Murthy so kindly agreed to spend uh, a few months with us and uh, liked it, uh, he was able to come and uh, spend some time here a few weeks ago. We said, well, then this is the best forum to actually, to actually inaugurate this forum. Generally, as many of you know, very informal group. And they said, this is a very good occasion to formally inaugurate it. One, because it leaves a history for us. And two, it leaves a kind of uh, expectation from us that we should reach, uh, an expectation we need to reach, especially after the first of this uh, inauguration. Uh, as Nikhil said, and I want to re-emphasize this, we really look forward to drawing on people from different constituent institutions here. Because um, you know, writers are writers, whether they are, it happens to be that they are also engineers and authors. As part of our center's activities, we've been doing a very interesting series of uh, courses on medical management for medical students. And we can actually see how how this kind of a dialogue with medical management students happens. So um, this was a great occasion to do this. And given our own interest, our students, leaders, the groups, and our other faculty, our interest is also in trying to make sense and understand that other interest. We want to situate ourselves in a very fundamental sense to locate to which we belong. And so, while we discussed various topics with us, we were very keen that we start this, this initiative with a talk on uh, Kandla, particularly Kandla. To us, it's, a, it's actually something which we see is very integral to our course. We hope our students will get more exposed to the advances of this local literature's kinds. So it is a great pleasure that it was Anandpur to agree to give us a talk on Canada politics. And I really don't need to introduce you to Prasad uh, but I need to say something in the sense, you know, uh, not all his achievements and so on, sort of you know, more about. Um, I think it's about the spirit of a man who is a writer, sometimes who masquerades as a writer, but a great humanist, activist, humanist, uh, academic, a teacher. And so he's not just a writer who is uh, doing something in the context of his art, but he's, a, he's also a craftsman who is doing something in the context of society and in the context of students. I remember still when we were trying to convince him to come here, the thing which I think most excited him about it is the, uh, the chance to teach students. He gives spend some time with the students to actually talk to them about these uh, different subjects and ideas. And that is a great amount So I want to invite you today not just as a great writer and so on, but also as a great teacher in an institution that all of us value teaching. So I um, have great pleasure in inviting when Sundar was talking to you about formal inauguration of this literary meet, I was reminded of my days in Maharaja's college in the 1950s when I did my English honors for three years and then MA for one year. We had a Wednesday literary club. If we, even if we missed a class, we never missed the Wednesday club. Because we found that our honored teachers, whom we were afraid of, would differ from each other and even quarrel in front of us and then forget their literary quarrel later on. So they became, literature became much more real, genuine. I still remember uh, an occasion when we had an old classical professor called Rangana, who was a great admirer of Milton. And we had just then read Keats, who had said, life to Milton is death to me. So he had given up the Miltonic. And then we students were very enthusiastic about Keats. And when he came to know of it, and Rangana stood up and said, there is puny Keats before this mighty Milton. And we fought with him for a full hour over this. And that was our release from 
from all the uh, formality of uh, literary meets but becoming literature becoming real and then we read milton much more intensely keats much more intensely because we got interested in this uh, question so literature is a production of uh, knowledge of a different kind but uh, if you get interested i think you know your all your faculties will be will be trained you know in the whole course of literary discussions and sundar is doing something new in this uh, institute in this university and i congratulate him and i will come and sit through uh, your literary meets here silently and also contribute when i feel like you know i will be a part of it when you have these literary meets i will myself give a few lectures with some poems and so on and then you can choose your own poems as we said and we can discuss it your own writing we can discuss it so let us um, spend some good time here today i'm going to talk about a very important topic for me for the world also on regional literatures in the context of globalization i was present with um, sheldon pollard when he planned to write his monumental work which you are going to be taught by nikhil next semester i think the language of gods in the world of men so i have seen the birth of the book and i have sort of participated in it in it and so i will talk about Kannada Mahakam of the 10th century a great Kannada text and as a writer you know this problem i face every now and then why don't i write it when it can reach a larger number of people why do i write in kannada and language which is geographically limited why do i write in any other language and my answer is because the dante wrote in their original language shakespeare wrote in their original language they were in their languages and great writers wrote in them and i think when homer wrote in their tribal language so but literature is not like science there is something like progress in science but in literature particularly in poetry a great poem may be born at any point in history homer There is no progress from Homer. There is something else. The Shakespeare is like very famous, you know, for all time is there. But at the time when Shakespeare wrote his plays, I don't think many highly educated Englishmen spoke English. They spoke French. That's why you have all the animals' names in Anglo-Saxon because the peasants who lot of the animals were poor people english speaking the meat eaters were uh, french knowing and so all the words for the meat are in french uh, but later on it changed english time but it took time for it to try in one of the things about india is this india is multi centered no is centered in so many places in telugu tamil malayalam hindi and in some regional uh, in some uh, language of the tribes when i was president of this academy some tribal people came and said that our language should be recognized i said we are here not to recognize languages but to recognize literature and said that we began to give prizes to texts in tribal and they be helps me set up a system for it. So the uh, academy expanded much more of India. Because you know, then I said, a yeah, tribal language may produce a Homer, but I am sure that it will not produce a Rasa. Because you know, to produce a Bertrand Rasa, the language has to grow, has to be very sophisticated. But some elemental forces can still make the language produce a Homer. So a tribal language may have a home, so we should have that kind of a respect for a tribal language. 
you know, that is the basis of Indian democracy also. It is a political question also, not merely a question of language. I will start with a very interesting story for me. I was president of Science Academy and then one day a man from Soviet Union, Soviet Union had just been broken up into pieces and uh, a person came to see me with my book from Tajikistan. My book Samskara in uh, Russia. It is a good translation of it in Russia. And a great Russian writer has a, written an introduction to it, which I have not read because I don't understand Russian. But I was told it was a good introduction. I came to know what the introduction was when this man came with the book. And he said, we have broken away from Soviet Union. I don't want my, he was a minister of culture. I don't want my state to be based on Islamic religion. Because we have moved far away from that kind of thing. But now we have nothing. We have been told that in order to write universal things, we should write in Russian. But only ethnic realities can be expressed in our languages. But here is your book and this man who writes the preface says, Anand Mukti writes in some language of the corner of India and takes a village and writes a universal novel. It doesn't have to be a language like Sanskrit or Latin or Russian or French to write universal, but an Indian believes that in any language the universal can be expressed. So he said, now you know we have a basis for our identity. If we can have a literary tradition, he said, if we can create one for ourselves, then I think we can be known as belonging to this kind of a literary world. So you should come to our country and then travel and be with us, inviting me and a few others, we went. And they had some literature of their own, but they were made to think that anything serious has to be done won't be in Russian. But the ethnic realities can be done in their languages. There was a trend in Indian languages also. In Marathi, for instance, if you write on a village, they call it uh, a novel based on uh, the word for it. And we also had that trend, you know, it was centered on a small place. You would say it is not a big novel, but a novel about a small place. But Canada never did it. The major novels in my language are all centered around some 10 or 15 kilometers. But it is a universal novel. It is not ethnic. There is one word which I hate that is ethnic. Very hateful word. We should never do that. And they said, we do it normally. It is not me. The first poet, Pampa, also did the same. You know, he really wrote Ramayana from Valmi. No, no, he wrote, he wrote Mahabharata, taking the whole story from Vedavya. He was well read and he knew Kalidasa, for instance, Pampa. You can see traces of Kalidasa's influence in his thing. And uh, when he rewrote Mahabharata, he did not translate it. He intervened into the story in a major way. How did he intervene? He was a deity. So he could not think of Krishna as a god. So since he was a deity, he made Arjuna a <coughs> hero. When he made Arjuna a hero, he also had his own interest. His own king was a Hindu. Abu was a king. His king was a Hindu. And he tried to equate Arjuna with his king. That was one way of flattering his king. So he made his own king the hero. And then if you read Mahabharata film, all the rivers of India flow into his Mahabharata and also Karnataka rivers flow into. 
and then he declared that what he wants to do is bring together Desi and Marga. By Desi he meant the indigenous, by Marga he meant languages like Sanskrit. Great way. So I have to Marga and Desi. So a new literary movement begins which doesn't shy away from any subject, however small. He doesn't think of something as being universal, something as being a thing, no. He takes everything seriously, a new literary tradition begins. And the whole thing is based on a very unique work about which Shadam Pollock has written an absolutely great thesis in his uh, book about Terrafers. I'm going to read in more detail. About 10 centuries this was written. And it was written by Vijaya, Sri Vijaya. And the king was Nurpatunga at that time. For a long time, people said it was written by Nurpatunga. But then they found out, no, it was Sri Vijaya. And my friend, Kevi Subarna, who have made an excellent comment on this, says, Kaviraja Marga also means many things. It is the Marga of the Kavirajas. It is the king of poets, what is the Marga? What is Kavi's Raja Marga? What is the main Marga? What is Kavi's Marga and Raja's Marga? Kavi's Marga, Sri Vidya is trying to find, and Guru Patala is trying to find Raja Marga. And if the Kavi Marga, Raja Marga meet, it is a good state. You know, there is a new definition of a state. The Kavi Marga and Raja Marga should be. And Subhanas thesis is excellent, you know, trying to find all these three hidden texts within the Kaviraj Mark. And when Kaviraj Marga was written, Kaviraj Marga uh, writer himself declares that there are many Kannadas, they are like the hoods of a serpent, thousand hooded serpent. <coughs> Among all these hoods, a particular Canada, spoken not in the city, not in uh, the capital, but in some part of Karnataka, is the Thirul Ganada, the essential Canada. There too he chose a land which is not the capital. That again is a very important fact to remember. But even then, you know, my friend Nagra objected to it. He said he is trying to destroy the other Kannadas by, uh, by empowering one Kannada. But do you know what has happened? In India, you know, you do not destroy anything. You make something higher, something higher. And for a long time it goes on like that. But there is a chance for the lower to become the higher. Whereas in Christian uh, uh, civilization, Wherever they went, they destroyed whatever they wanted. The languages were destroyed, gods were destroyed. Whereas here, Vadirada himself went around and put every Bhuta under some Shiva. So the Bhuta exists and Shiva also exists. Now both have existence. Whereas all the Bhutas were destroyed in Christianity, but not here. So this is one way of preserving, you see, the hierarchizing. Also is one way of preserving. And so that hierarchy continues. And hence you suddenly find a great writer using a language which is considered the language of the um, real within Canada. Now the very right like Devon Mahadeva, writes in a dialect which is spoken only by people who can't read or write. But he writes great stories in that. So they are alive. They are available for Canada. And a great poet like Vendra said, let everything be available because you create a language how all the bylanes go and meet the high lane. The high lane, but you travel through all the bylanes in order to reach the high lane. So the marga and desi get combined and the language begins to grow. English grew like that. And now English takes from other languages also. 
Canada can take from its own resources to grow. This is true of Canada, this is true of the other private resources. So there is another <coughs> great book in Tamil, Kalkapiyam. Somebody should talk about it. I am not good at that, but let us see. Now we have a talk on Kalkapiyam. How does it uh, face this issue of creating a literary tradition for a certain time? And what is very important about Kerala is whenever one talked about language, one assumes that it is a language universe. But here is a definition of a language which is geographically limited. Sri Vijaya begins this text saying, Kaveri in Godavari Varavita Kannada Nadol. From Kaveri to Godavari. Two rivers it takes. Whatever land exists between these two rivers is imagined as Canada land. Bhavita Mahada Janapadam. Janapadam means the common people who are imagined as Canada people. So he talks about a language which is restricted to this jet state. But then immediately he says, although it is Whereas Sanskrit was not like that, it was Devapada. It was spoken by the gods, and so it had no geographical limitation. So he is defining Canada in relation to Sanskrit, which has no geographical limitation. He says there is a limitation, and then goes on to say, there is the beautiful Canada version, you know, I will not say it, but I will try to summarize it. He says that the world is mirrored in it. And it mirrors itself. The language is a mirror held to the world. And the world looks at it itself through this mirror. And hence, its geographical restriction doesn't restrict its design to include any theme of the world. Like English, you know, that Shakespeare chose. He wrote on Julius Caesar, on Romeo and Juliet on world history, anything in English began to... Although English is not still the language of the world, it acts as the language of the world only in Shakespeare, not when Bush speaks. <laughs> only in Shakespeare, when it is not a language of the world, when it is a regional language, it is the language of the world, of aspirations and so on. There are black people in it, there are all kinds of people. You know, after Veda Vyasa, there is no other author as lost as Shakespeare. But that happened when? When Kaviraj Marga things can happen to Canada also. You know, that's the destiny it gives. You know, it's not limited because the language is limited. And people think that it is a translation of Dandi because he bases a lot of it on. Dandi is, Dandi has a Sanskrit text, <coughs> he bases it on the Sanskrit text, but he uses the Sanskrit text to move away from it. Why? In order to suit the needs of Canada, he changes Dandi. There again he is very bonita. So he takes a basic text and then changes it. 70 <coughs> percent is uh, original. 30% is translation from that. And then another very interesting thing that happened to Canada was this. When the Brahmi script was adopted, it was about second, second century BC, Tamil took the Brahmi script, took only 26 alphabets that were in a part speaking Tamil. That's why in Tamil it's difficult to write Gandhi. It is Kanti, I have to read it as Gandhi. You can write it, you can never write Clinton. It's only Clinton. Whereas in Canada you can write Clinton, you can write Gandhi. Because we took all the 52 aspects. Even this decision that Canada did centuries ago to keep useless alphabets 
can be used as. Has helped Canada grow. Because you can take any word from any language and put it into Canada. There are various ways in which you can make a, make a word into Canada. You have to add a who, chair, chair, table, table. They become easily Canada. House, house, wife, home. Anything becomes Canada. And that's why I was mischievous, you know, the chief minister was there and he said, what can we do for Karnataka? I said, change the name of Bangalore. He is Bangalore. And then he caught him. And then the whole world curses me because I changed the word Bangalore. It is something, you know, that was very useful for them in business. It became Bangalore. So somebody asked me, why did you do it? In order to hurt you, I said. Hurt your business. And also there was another reason I said, Bengaluru is a word which is very Canada because it ends with a sound who. So if an Englishman learns to say Bengaluru, he has learned to say a bit of Canada. You know? Like you know, when I learn to say a British word, I have learned something of English. So it would compel somebody to get an essence of your language by place names and so on. But the British were such, you know, they did change the place names. So much that I am told that in some countries they have lost their identity because all the place names have been changed by default. And we have not allowed that to happen. And uh, my resistance was also that kind of resistance. Like Kolkata and Chennai. And people say it is foolish, it may be foolish, but it is one way of If my tongue, if his tongue cannot say Bengaluru, why should I also change my tongue? Why should I not keep insist on the name being the same? So, the Canada word can be formed easily by adding a rule. So, many words can be borrowed you know, from any language. There are many Persian words in Canada because people who use Persian as an official language. So, all the Kacheri language is uh, Persian. And our great poet Kumar Vyasa, 13th, 14th century, he was Canada in such a way that Shakespeare is possible in Kumar Vyasa's diction. He writes Mahabharata because he is a great bhakta, he can't be a Shakespeare. But Shakespeare was not a bhakta, that's why he was a great writer. But Kumar Vyasa was such a great bhakta that when he sees Krishna, he forgets him. He becomes, you know, very, uh, very weak for Krishna. But he's a great lyrical poet. And his <coughs> language is mysteriously vast because he has no fear of using a Persian or any word, you know, in the <coughs> classical Canada writing. So they have a Kumarana, you know, who makes us think that Shakespeare is possible in this language. Possible body language, but you have to have that kind of a genius. Uh, before Kaviraja Marga, although he says there were literary texts, but we don't find many literary texts before Kaviraja Marga. Only after Kaviraja Marga we find First great poet was Kapanagar. He comes within a century of the But by then, in temple construction and music, Karnataka was in the world. And although he visualized Kannada existing between Kaveri and Godavari, it has sometimes extended to the mid, sometimes has come smaller than the limit. And when Karnataka state was formed, it was almost like Kavira Ramanga's dream fulfilled. That's why, you know, there used to be a song that Kaliga sang, Udeva Agalena Pancharova Kannada Nara. Udeva Agalena Pancharova And after Karnataka was formed, somebody sang, then Bindre got up and said, No, you should just say Udeva Nima. 
because we can never be satisfied. We should still follow our father, Gudeva. So we have kept that portion, Gudeva. Okay, why is this very important? You must have heard of a man called Drija, 15th, 16th century. He was a contemporary of between Isabella of Spain. The two people who approached uh, Isabella, one was Columbus, who said, I will extend your empire by traveling and accessing other land areas. And then Nebrija went to her and said, what an empire you have. People don't have a grammar. They speak their the life everywhere. It doesn't look like an empire at all. And so you have to have a grammar. So one builds an empire through a grammar. The other builds an empire through extending the land space. I think a country gets its identity both by both these ways. By having there yeah, is some kind of a grammar for its language. A grammar which is flexible enough, but now there is a big controversy in Karnataka. There are two schools. My friend Subana belongs to the more orthodox school. There is another, you know, one, one called Shankaravatta, a great genius. He belongs to another school. Shankaravatta goes on arguing that we should rewrite our grammar because Canada has changed. There is no difference now between sa, sha, sha. We kept that difference in order to see the caste of the man. The other caste man can't say sa, sha, sha. So it was caste distinguisher and so it should go. So he is for a new grammar for Canada. But the old school says no, we still need a grammar. And their argument is if you don't have a grammar, and the language goes on changing every year and you allow it to change. After 10 years you can't read the book that is written away. And hence, in order to have a continuity, you have to have a grammar. Subhanna's argument was, in order to have a continuity in culture, you have to have a grammar. And the other is, in order to have challenge in the to be alive to the moment, you should not have a grammar. Now that's a living debate. Okay. And even those who say we don't need a grammar, do that grammar. And those who say, you know, we need a grammar can make grammatical mistakes. You know, that's true. I have seen this kind of a strange thing in Maharashtra, in Goa. When I was president, I had to go to Goa many times to talk to company people. And you know, there is a big quarrel in Goa. There is both Marathi and Goa and uh, okay. A group came to me and said, you have allowed them to have a Marathi uh, institute here. But there should be a Mongani institute, not a Marathi institute. They said, our ancient language is Marathi. We should have a Marathi institute. They were born, born they were arguing for a long time and then I asked, in what language are you arguing? They were arguing in the book. Even the Marathi uh, championship was made in Konkani. And the Konkani championship was both. And then I said, what do you pray in the Marathi? They pray Marathi songs. Everybody, even Konkani. They speak Konkani, but use Marathi songs early in the morning to make their story. So, you know, in India, that we just cross one the other. So too, perhaps, even in the Kaviraji Marathas, Kara's time and else, he tries to keep it as pure as possible, not totally pure, and hence there is a, uh, an attempt at a grammatical structure. You do Vasuda, Vadaya, Vinayana, Vishada, Vishaya, Vishesham, that is the word. Vasuda, Vadaya, Vinayana, Vishada, Vishaya, Vishesham. This is particular and still completely one with the world, one with the world, but still stands out. And there is another sentence in this great book. What is good? If you can tolerate the opinions of others and religions of others, then it is good. 10th century. If you can value 
if you can tolerate the opinions of others and the visions of others, then it is good. No surprise is added because Sri Vichira himself was a Jain. The king was a Hindu. And he is there working together. And then religious tolerance was a must. And tolerance of different ideas was a must. Now it is not. You know what is happening in Bangalore? That is the battle I am in. Some of my colleagues among writers, older writers, you know, they want to honor Arke Narayan. And they have issued a statement saying Arkanarayan is no good, he never learned Kannada, he spoke only Tamil, he translated only Kambaramayana, so he should not be honored. Immediately I said, this is nonsense, Arkanarayan is a Karnataka writer. Not Kannada writer, Karnataka writer. He lived in the state, he wrote about Mysore, he was influenced by his writing. And his characters typically come with a gunny bag. Gandhi photo on it with vegetables and go takes it to the host house and gives it. He's a Mysore young man, a very character. And they suddenly say he's a Tamilian. And what, you know, these are all the writers of, uh, some, some of them are older, meaning older than me, one is going to be nearly a hundred. I just come into the So they are going to be still at one. There should be somebody who should find it out. And this has often happened and I have been uh, um, sometimes in danger also. I can't write to this. At the time, my wife remembers, I had to have police help to go to the university and come back. So during both organizations. Because the boy was the beat and he had a Urdu book. Then I attacked the whole both organizations. So, but if I don't do it, then I don't live up to the standard set by a book that was written by Srivijaya. Gandhi, he takes Gandhi, but Gandhi was a wife. So he is, uh, you know, he is a jail, trying to create a poetics. But he goes to a Vaidic text and he works with a Vaidic So Sri Vijaya, who wrote this, didn't believe in God. You are a you can't believe in God. And hence, this great book doesn't have a prayer in the beginning. Otherwise, any kavya begins with a <coughs> prayer. You know, Kalidasa Sastana begins with a prayer. But this doesn't begin with a prayer. But it is a thing. So all these are there in our tradition and it gives Canada a certain kind of an identity. The kind of identity that my friend from Soviet Union, broken Soviet Union, was searching for. Not an identity in religion, not an identity in anything else, but identity in a cultural, literary tradition. And that we created in Karnataka. And in Tamil it was created, in Telugu it was created by its own people, in Marathi it was created in its own way. And I think in uh, all over India. Bengali. It was created in different ways. But according to Shatan Paula, the first great work of that kind was Kavirati Mahatma. In the world, not merely in India, but in the world, because there are two instances. You know, Dante <coughs> decides to write in his own language, not in Latin. And then he writes a, a pamphlet arguing why he should write in his own language. But he writes that pamphlet in Latin, not in the language in which he wants to write. Milton writes, again, saying that how, why all the European languages should become free from Latin and Greek, should be on their own. But he again writes it in Latin, not in English. Why? Because he could reach a larger audience if he wrote it in Latin, a European audience. Newton also wrote in Latin, but Darwin wrote in English. That's a very important question. Why did Darwin, upon people, write in English, whereas his contemporary scientists would write in Latin? 
And so Darwin affected the English masses. You know, after Darwin, the entire British literature was in great conflict about religious matters. It was a, a book which went straight into the culture of the English. You know, the English. Whereas this plea for writing in languages also came through Latin. Sheldon says that a thousand years ago, there was, there was a great wave in the world where all these little languages, the regional languages, the so-called regional languages, became languages of identity of certain countries, French, German, Italian. And hence, when there was one word in, there are many Wiltons, many Keatses, many Shakespeare's, more creative. Here there was one Kalidas, one Bhavagur, and then when India also broke from thousand years ago into many regional languages, then you have several writers in Hindi, in Marathi, in several languages, in Canada, in Tamil. So there is a lot of creativity because of decentralization of the world language breaks and then you have more creative. Now there is a reverse. I think our own children will write in English. Charles Sim said, we should thank Nehru because we have made it possible for our own grandchildren to talk to us in English. And he said it very sarcastically. But that has happened. That is happening all over the world. It is happening even in Europe, you know, the, the language English. I have gone to small European countries where the writers complain any American novel, foolish romantic novel, gets translated into their languages. And the bookstores are full of them. The novels written in their own language only said, this is true in Korea. In Korea, Saul Bello is available. Anything, you know, within a week, they don't even take permission, they translate and they publish. And their languages don't have take so The language is there as a medium for translations to take over. So there is another movement now in the world. In, in that kind of a movement, we were talking about something which had, which was there, but it was reversed, and now there is another reversal because of economic, cultural, political reasons and also not because Britain is a great power, America is a great power. But the same people within some 20-25 years will say we should all learn Chinese. But the regional language is So they will shift to Chinese because then it will become a language without which you can't do business. That must have happened to the English language. But the English language that the business is not the language that created a Shakespeare in a different manner. That I think Avila Marga was aware of so far as Sanskrit and He knew that there were many defects in Canada. And Sanskrit was a more pure language. But he was championing the cause of the language of the people. Because it is a mirror for the world, the actual people, the people center, the last question. Any comments or questions? Uh, uh, because you started your talk by referring to Subarna's article on Kaviraj Marga, for some reason, uh, I was thinking through Supana's many articles to understand your talk. And uh, there is one uh, technical uh, issue which I am curious about because you said Kaviraja Marga is written not by Chaturanga but by Sri Vijaya. But including Supana, many people think that it is both by Nupatanga and Sri Vijaya. So that is my uh, curiosity about the technical. The other, uh, question I want to ask you is, you said that Shakespeare was not a bhakta and he became a great boy, but Kumar Vyasa is a bhakta, he forgets everything else when he remembers Krishna. 
So even to understand this statement, I come through Sumana's comment on Kuenko's article, Kuenko's novels. When he writes the uh, article on Kuenko, uh, Kuenko in the book of uh, In Kuenko's novels, what happens is, it happens in Tirthahendi. But somewhere in uh, US, Vivekananda knows what's happening in Tirthahendi. And many things like this happen to who I are and all the characters. So, uh, critics in Kannada uh, commented that Poem would have become a great novelist if he had not done all these things. And uh, they also said that there is no fresh translation available in English of Poem Poo. That's why he did become a great poet. Subhanna makes a very important comment in the uh, essay by telling that you cannot do that because if you edit Poenpu's novels and take off all those mystical elements, it would read like a novel written by an Englishman who comes to Tirtaiti and makes notes of all these people and write a novel. So, I'm just curious to understand your statement that uh, where you compare Shakespeare and Kumar Vyasa and tell that Shakespeare is not a bhakta, so he's a great poet, and Kumar Vyasa is a bhakta and he's not up to Shakespeare's. Uh, I don't read sentence, I do not say who is great, who is not great. There are two different kinds of writers. A bhakta is more lyrical. Shakespeare is more dramatic. Shakespeare's attention is as much on common freedom as on a heart. On good as well as evil. You know, it's like it's not I didn't write himself with any character. It is a negative capability. <coughs> you know, he has a very great, great passage. He's a bird pecking, and he says, I am that bird now pecking, so I am not myself. I am this, I am that, I am that. And Though he is criticizing words, the words of the something of his dream, I don't have to. I have no self. And hence, that is the original. Self should not be clean. Whereas in the Kampa is closer to Shakespeare. Kumar Vyasa is closer to the Bhakti tradition. Bhakti tradition has its own lyrical, wonderful things. You know, it can produce a Walt Whitman It can produce uh, in our own days, you know, the great uh, beat poet and so on. You know, they are all coming in. Lyrical kind of how that form, that. But they are not dramatic, imagined spaces. That's why I say that. I should not say who is superior to whom. That's not very important. Because sometimes you, know, you like this much more than the other. Shakespeare, you know, Eliot preferred Dante to Shakespeare. Because Dante is as a lyrical element, moving towards God. It looks like as if Rupadunga is also writing. Because it is also the Rajamarga, it is also the Tavimarga. 
how a state should be governed as well as how a form should be written. It's a book about how a form should be written, how a state should be governed. And hence it looks as if it is Kavi and Raga together written in the book. So it could be even the other. So there is no evidence to say it was in the press in India. But you can imagine that. Go to Rupert again, you know. That's what I think. The query about uh, the comparison between the way Tordhakyam and others works out. And a large part of Tordhakyam and uh, Tamil literature, from Kaki, is, uh, from what I've read of cultural geography, is uh, they use the place, uh, the place geography, Tinai, to actually uh, assimilate themselves into a cultural landscape. Like you said, Kampa brought the rivers in. Did Kanda literature of this, at least in Kaviraj Maga and other, others of this genre, use that kind of place. I know they use names of rivers, but they, they use the geography of the place in their writings. As a matter of fact, it's a good question because I have read Ramanujan on this. In Tamil form, you just have to name a flower and that flower evokes a whole large it's number awesome. of ideas. Uh, I don't think we have it in Canada. That's very, very great about Tamil. It's almost as if you, know, you can pick up one object to suggest a whole landscape. Uh, that, so in his translation of what is it, Love and War, Poems of Love and War, that's another text you know, which you can access. It is available in I hope the yeah, Poems of Love and War. And there are great translations of these poems in a way. What is that flower you know, which <coughs> appears once in uh, Kurunji. Kurunji. Once in how many years? Kurunji. Kurunji. So many things enough to make it. That's why you Tamil. People say Tamil means beautiful. This is an extension of what I'm studying. I think every mother tongue is closely associated with the own motherland, their own motherland. And uh, currently, in this present generation, so what could be the contributing factors which can influence the work of a uh, literature, I mean, the, the literary work, because we see a lot of homogenization of society being happening. People losing their identities because uh, the whole world is trying to go, go towards one single idea, ideology. So, people are losing their identity. Like, for example, in Canada, 20 years back, which, when I was studying in school, the, the flavor of the language was quite different, but now the, the flavor is gone. So what could be the defining moment and how we can preserve this freshness? I don't agree that the flavor is gone. The flavor is still there. Because people like to speak uh, in almost a monotonous way of speaking. No. Uh, you know, there is no easy answer to it. But I, I remember a very moving moment in my life. I met an Australian poet. He belonged to one of those uh, tribes who have been assimilated or have been destroyed. So the poet, I think he knew it. But he was trying to rediscover his thoughts and his language. He came and talked. My aim in my life is to rediscover my ancestors with the Christian missionaries destroyed. And my language, which again, we were punished when we spoke. This was done in previous years. We were punished when we spoke that time. And the last, I want to read this. If that kind of a thing happens, even rarely, it means languages don't disappear that easily. They do. They are dying now. Quite a few languages of the time. But in India's case, I have said it and I have been attacked by my friends for saying that we are safe because we are a backward country. <coughs> I have said it I have said it in Germany. You can't really take over us because we are illiterate and backward. We will be a burden to you. And so we are safe from you. I won't say it in India, huh? but I will say it in Europe. 
My language has been preserved for me by my people who can't read or write. I have a Kannada audience, a potential audience. Tamils have a potential Tamil audience. They are the working class, the poor, the backward. That you can't forget, you know. India has been. What happens to our class is different. Our class gets easily, and it is the last for our class also. And some of us realize, some of us don't realize. But we can also go too far, like my friends know, who think that Arke Narayan was a, a villain because he did not speak Kannada. That again is another. So you have to balance your steps every time and see that you don't go into illiberal excesses in this. But mind you, India has always lived with more than one man. I am very sure that when here in Urdu, Madhvacharya was here, 13th century, he must have spoken with Tulu in his village, Kannada in Urdu, and Sanskrit elsewhere. He would have lost all the three languages. Shankaracharya must have done all the <coughs> We have always lived with self more than one time. That is India's genius. And we will do that. So we will keep, uh, there is a famous Ramanujan poem which I always use. When I am hungry, I speak Tamil because my mother who cooks food speaks Tamil. So in the kitchen my language is Tamil. In, uh, in the streets when I go to play, my language is Kannada because all the mysterious boys are Kannada boys. When my father calls me upstairs, who was a mathematician, I speak in English because my father wants me to become a, a big uh, scholar and be known all over India. So I speak English upstairs. Tamil kitchen, Canada streets. So sometimes it changes. You begin to talk to God in the language of the streets. Then you have a Bhagavan, you have a Tabir. And you choose to speak to God. Or to your love. So then the language status changes. Um, I'd just like to quote the Algerian writer Patek Yassin. Actually hunted down the quote because I think it's very appropriate to what we were just talking about. And he was writing about the, the dilemma of writing in French or in Arabic, because Algeria was a French colony. Um, and he said, Francophony is a neo-colonial political machine which only perpetuates our alienation. But the usage of the French language does not mean that one is an agent of a foreign power. And I write in French to tell the French that I am not French. And I guess for me, the question is, as an Indian, do you think it's possible? for us to use the language of the colonizers, to appropriate it in our own way. We are doing it, right? Yeah. yeah. Otherwise, there would have been no space for English. Yeah. You know, it is like the you know, King Tempest. Caliban says, you have, you have taught me English, and now I will curse you. English. So, we have done the Caliban to them. <laughs> Quick India, in what time is it? Sir, regarding Dr. Uh, Shah Saha, uh, uh, what is your final opinion? What is your firm decision? Whether should be there, uh, you should have the uh, in the Kannada scriptures so that uh, our children should also read and learn that uh, words. Sometimes, you know, the thing, Shah Saha may change the meaning of the Hindi word. He changed it. So it, it is uh, important. For determining the meaning of the word, otherwise, even if you want to keep the distinction, it will go. It's okay. But uh, what is the word in English? It's not that you that distinguishes distinguishes the search. No, no. Yes, I can distinguish the meaning of the word. Fixes the meaning of it. Contrast it. Well, um, when you think of another question, I want to bring this question, your know, discussion back to your know, practice as a writer. Um, who among the Kannada writers, as poets, Kannada poets, influenced your own work? 
and if they did in what sense? How does poetry in a specific sense of Canada Canada poetry? Uh, can you see resonances of that in your own non poetry? Where where would you place yourself in that Now, when you say I write in Canada, you have to add so many other statements. Canada of what region? Canada of uh, which Canada that I knew at what stage of my life? The straight answer to your question is my. Poetic sensibility was modeled during my college days when I was studying in honors. I was a great fan of Shelley, Wordsworth, because they are the poets who influenced our earlier writers in Canada. There was a great romantic writing in Canada, poem, poem, and other. They were all influenced by. Wordsworth, Shelley, like uh, Tagore, or Tagore also, Shelley was a So we came up with that, and then the Eliot's influence was there in India. Tagore called it influence, not influence, but influence on it. But Tagore himself translated one of the poems of Eliot later on. He was moved by that film translator. But first he called it influenza. So it, it spread like influenza really. But there was always great Sanskrit poetry which you liked because of its sound, you know, sound quality you know, in your ears. And the old Kannada poetry which you remembered because it was a text. So it begins to follow a certain sensibility, but not directly into your writing. What came directly into my writing was uh, the poetry of Gopal Krishna Dita. When I was doing it on, I resisted it because it was not Italian. It was very ironic, very significant. It didn't look at life in a pleasant way. It was unpleasant. Unpleasant even in sound. It was uh, unpleasant, bitter, uh, resisted it, but then I couldn't because it caught the, the rhythm of the times. You know, there is a famous statement of uh, Plato don't believe poets because by changing the rhythm, a poem or a word. I changed the whole civilization. There is some truth in it. Actually, when I went to Britain in the 1960s, Britain was changing, and that change could be seen in the Beatles. Beatles were becoming important. As Beatles became important, there was a change in the whole cultural scene of India. Much more out, outgoing and so on. And then they opened up to Sita, to melodious music. So the opening of the ears, that happens in a in your own mother tongue poetry. There's a new rhythm, new layer. And that happens. And that is what we call auditory imagination. It can't be explained why, but it moves you beyond me. Very simple group of words. Can move like me. And then it may make mean many things to you. I think it is so with the game. For those who know English, you know, they, you know, Keats wouldn't sleep when he wrote a thing of beauty is a constant joy. Then his brother said it doesn't sound correct. And he thought for many days and changed it. A thing of beauty is joy forever. What is the difference? You know, the meaning is the same, but I think of it is joy forever appeals to the auditory imagination. So there is something like auditory imagination. 
you listen to a meaning beyond me. And that will really happen at an age when you are open to such things. Not when you, when the world is too much with you, getting it, spending, you may waste your purpose. When you become jada, it doesn't move you. But if you open at a certain point, and then they have to, once the other Chitta told me, Narakita was a great poet himself, although he was a, uh, what a big accountant in you know, the railways. He, he was a very nice poet. It was he was somewhere and he read a poem of Aliga and could speak for days together because there was a line in it which had changed for him the whole rhythm of the Kannada poet. I still know the design. You know, it doesn't mean anything to you. If you look at whom did it mean? It says, some 14 years ago, a green parrot, a green beaked bird, called me, come, come, come. Adhanal Kovar Shagada Hindi. Hasir Kovar Shagada Hindi. Ba, 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 yandu karanitta, manna karanitta. Ba, ba, ba. It breaks the usual rhythm of the lion. Right? Uh, uh, you have done something wonderful. It's a simple thing, but if you are very deep into your life, as you know, very simple changes will change the control of the meaning. It is not the stuff of poetry, you know, to hear the music. Because you know, if you take a poem and then see what is this, what is the stuff in it, it's very hard to it. I will do a poem of the day <coughs> with you, you know, one of these days, which describes an early morning. It is a very ordinary poem in the translation. But it is magical if you listen to it in me. Yes. It is magical only if you know the language. So it is not available in translation, which is untranslatable. In order to translate, you should know what is untranslatable. I think we have addressed the issue of morality, uh, especially when it comes to poetry, and we are talking about sound and thinking. Uh, there's been work done by Milton Parry and others on Homeric poems, and they say they're actually not written, but they're actually verbal poems, which are then translated in the right game. And so, again, you were talking about rhythm, and uh, we are talking about different styles of writing. I was wondering if a more oral poet, who you have a mnemonic structure, so the analysis they make of Homeric poems is that there is a mnemonic structure which uh, hexameter lines can be made and you keep adding them, you keep adding them, you keep adding them. So do you think there would be a contrast between a uh, culture which is more dominated by the written in composing more dramatic scenes, whereas a poet with a more oral tradition would create more like rhythmic, that you can remember it well, and that is one part of the question. Uh, I would just answer. It's a very important question. As a matter of fact, oral literature is the birth of all this morality. Particularly poetry. That's why I said a language may not produce a rasam, but it can produce a homo. You know, it is contained in my statement. In order to produce a rasal, you have to make a very articulative thing out of them. Prose itself is not. It has to be right. One. Two. In Canada, Vakini Palas. You have a constant access to oral literature in Canada from Pampa onwards. That's why Papa says Desi, when he says Desi, the oral morality of it. When it, when it comes to a poet like Bailey, a lot of it comes from morality. <coughs> it is written. Even when you read the written, you change it into its oral form. Whereas with some writers, it is much more written than for So you have both, as a matter of fact, you have both. Like, if you go to Dylan, Dylan Thomas, right? In English, Eliot borrows more from the written tradition, somebody else may borrow more from the oral. But the oral is not available to English as much as to the language. In that context, can we also look at the authorship problem between the king and the poet, as the poet is composing in his oral form, 
uh, his R this plus meter. Not okay. This is not over. Kaviraj Marga is not over. But given the tradition, the Indians ask for tradition no, no. of being a very old. No, no, no. What happens is, you know, the Shadan Power has uh, taken up this question. Although you have a rich old literature, you become a literary tradition only when you literalize it. Some word you and pick up a word in it. That means you know, when you put it in alphabets, when you write, actually Pampa comes in the written tradition. And the follow from the oral tradition. That's a different thing. Whereas, whereas you have the great uh, what is that uh, oral epic you know, which has been published recently in Canada? It is an epic where Allama is made into a, a tarit rebel. And he comes into the poem, you know, with a dead uh, lamb <coughs> meat and a uh, and liquor in another hand. Allama is changed. It's a long poem. It is remembered. It is now written down. There are Mahakavyas like that. I think there must be many in Tamil Mahakavyas. Now they are all getting. But you know, you have various versions. This woman may speak, sing one version, another woman may speak, sing another version. And so to find a certain basic version is very hard. But they have been doing it now. But the literature that I spoke of begins with Shasanas. Actually, you know, there is a beginning for Indian literature, say the Shasanas, where it is written in stone, you see, stone and things. We have no more comments, but let me formally thank for Shasanasi for taking his time and his time, his energy to be with us today. And, uh, hopefully start us off uh, on a different path, something which hope will be very engaging, which I'm sure most of you will be part of. Just to re-emphasize uh, the people from outside, other institutions also to come, be part of this group and work with the I must also mention that on Thursday, uh, Zanat Kunti is going to be awarded a very prestigious award for the Mohammed Bashir Award. Those of you who know Michael uh, Mohammed Rashid know he's one of the great writers in Malayalam. Now, on Thursday, there is an award which is being given by the trust, uh, the Bashir Trust, to which all of which use the Bashir Award. And uh, we will also be having another great Malayalam writer, another young beat award winner, like Sam Murthy, his own friend, uh, Mr. M.P. Vasudevan Nair, who's another very well known. Writer. Coming and talking in this event, along uh, uh, with uh, PJ George. So, we welcome all of you on behalf of uh, the Russian Trust to this award ceremony on Thursday at 6 o'clock at the Planet And uh, it will be a very interesting affair. It uh, will also end with the screening of a movie by Bashi, which was made, which won the national award. Great to have all of you, and I hope we will see all of you. What time is it? Six, six to me. And uh, Vasudev and I, others are going to be speaking. Let me felicitate my friends. So thank you all for coming, and I hope we will see you.